Welcome back, WNSG, Jason Baltimore and Baltimore Positive. And we are positively excited about this episode. You know, back when we started, I don't know that we had State Fair even as a sponsor yet. Or I think we did the first show down at Pizza John's, and I, I got my cup here. I didn't bring Dutch any pizza, but I, so I'll, I'll get him some pizza at some point. But <laughs> we, did at pizza we didn't have State Fair, Don. We didn't have uh, we didn't have El Guapo. We didn't have our friends at Taharka, Moeller and Gary. All Fadley's. Of our, we didn't Fadley's. have Fadley's. We, we didn't have faith these crab cakes and now this is our ceremonial 300th episode dutch and we are we are now a full website we've taken everything we've done at wnsd everything we're ever going to do now is going to be baltimore positive and don i think it's because we we kicked it off with dutch right who who was our first there can only be one right nestor there can only be one number one who was our first guest Dutch Rupert's Burger at Pizza John's. Where's the pizza? <laughs> well, come on. See, I knew he was going to give us a hard time I'm about that. Now, I mean, you know, this, this, with a, we're, we got tough things going on here. But congratulations to the 300th anniversary or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> team Lester, you're the man. If you can't do it, nobody can. Well, right? listen, we're going to be, th <laughs> be, be 3,000 of these into this. Um, <laughs> and, and listen, I'm beginning every one of my, uh, my segments, sports, uh, my elementary school teacher was on this week with vote. We want everybody to vote. I got my ballot out. I just want everybody to know that that's the most important thing that's going on. What what keeps you up at night right now? I mean, I, I remember getting together with you, and it was, you know, cyber and, and cyber hacking. And at this point, with the government being where it is and, and – uh, and, and obviously COVID with the president and we're watching vice presidential debates and we all have election issues and we're all trying to get the votes going here. What's keeping you up right now, Dutch? Well, I sleep pretty well. Uh, I feel I have confidence in our country. I have confidence in some of our leadership, especially in, in our intelligence community, our military. Uh, they, they, they're good people. And that is why we're still the best country in the world. Uh, there are a lot of concerns out there. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, our leader uh, keeps making threats, and if he loses the election, it's going to be a fraud, and he's setting up the post office as he did. Unfortunately, that was really serious. Um, we were getting calls about people not getting their mail. I, in the very beginning, went to Dundalk personally. I talked to close to 40, 35 people in line, and almost everyone except for one was not getting their mail. They weren't getting their, their prescription drugs, their checks, things that, things that they needed. I then walked inside and talk to the employees. They were a little reluctant at first, but after a while they opened up. You know, what happened, you know, the, Trump put in this, this guy who headed the post office, the first time they had anyone working in the post office that didn't have experience. Um, what happened is that he took equipment away from the distribution center, and that's the center that sorts the mail, and they get, then goes to the local post offices who deliver the mail. And if you know, you, you work and know people in the post office since 1775, it's, it's a group of people that know their goal is to get the mail out. Rain, snow, sleet, whatever. The mail keeps moving ahead. And it wasn't happening. And it was wrong. And thank goodness we jumped on it in time to make sure that we're getting the mail the, the best way we can. These issues of fraud, it's ridiculous. The FBI, everyone has said there's no fraud. There hasn't been any fraud. Uh, the president used an excuse for maybe somebody who was overworked and there were a couple pieces of mail in the trash or whatever. That's the type of thing that happens. We are the United States of America, the best country in the world. One of the reasons for that is that everyone uh, who's, who's qualified has a vote. That's part of our system. Our system of checks and balances. That's what keeps us together as a country. And we're not going to have a dictatorship. That we have the checks and balances where Congress takes care of the purse. Uh, then you have the courts to interpret it. So we, we have to make sure people feel secure about their vote and, and the votes are going to, to make a difference. Now, whoever wins, then they're gonna be president pursuant to the law, but it's got to be legal. And that's where we're getting a lot of issues and, and calls right now. Our office, by the way, since the COVID thing started, and, and I'd say around uh, March, um, have had at least 30,000 emails, phone calls, uh, or, or uh, uh, those two, I mean, basically. Uh, and, and that's a lot of, lot of work, a lot of people, a lot of people who are concerned. A lot of it has to do with their paychecks. A lot of it has to do with getting, you know, the, the money that uh, the unemployment insurance that the state gives out, but we help the feds give them the money 
to help give it out. So these are just some of the things that are happening now, but we have to stop this fear mongering and we have to deal with the facts. Well, Dutch, I, I want to jump in there. You, you touched on so many things, but I want to zero in on one because I think one of the, one of the things that you've become known for is you have a great admiration, respect, and relationship with the nation's military. I always think of you as a guy who really gets the military and particularly has a respect for the leadership of our military. What I hear over and over, and maybe you can talk to our listeners and help them, if you sleep okay, maybe you can help them sleep a little better. And that has to do with transition of power. <clears throat> In this nightmare scenario where Trump loses, which is I think those of us on this show hope happens because we think this what's going on is indecent. But should Trump lose and then say, I am not leaving, the election was rigged, the election was a fraud, and it appears that's what he's laying the groundwork for. How do you see the military in the United States reacting at that moment? Well, the first thing, the military at this point would not be involved. Um, and, and you talked about my relationship with the military. In Congress, we specialize. Uh, you know, I was uh, on the House Select Intelligence Committee, and we oversee the, 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 all the intelligence agencies, um, and then in leadership. Uh, I'm co-chair of the Army Caucus, so we deal with all the Army and help them with their budget. And I'm also chairman of the Naval Academy Board. So throughout the years, I've developed a relationship of trust, and that's what's important. And everybody needs, uh, as far as our agencies, to stay in their lane. So if, if Trump starts, if he loses the election, and, and then he refuses to leave, uh, you're going to have when, the day that the new president is sworn in, January 20th, and if Trump refuses to leave, the Secret Service will be involved and escort him out. If he won't go, they'll do whatever they have to do. Uh, but the military won't be involved. The military will only be involved when it's a total national security and where they need to be there to enforce um, the, the uh, peace in our neighborhoods. And, and that's really where the military will be. So at that point, it's not going to be there. Trump is trying, I think, because he's down the polls, he's trying to create a situation of fraud and um, mailing. There have been no incidents of fraud throughout the years. Trump has voted himself three times. The military, the last 50, 60 years, has voted through mail. Uh, the checks and balances are there. But, you know, when you have a caged animal who starts to panic um, and he says these things that irritate people, when it came out that he was not going to leave the office, uh, that scared a lot of people. We got a lot of calls about that. And we tried to calm them down and say, look, we've got the checks and balances. We're on top of this. Uh, and and we, we're going to know what to do if there's an individual that cares more about himself than about the United States of America and the people who live there. Dutch, I, I want to tell you, you know, I never had Don Moeller as, a, as my civics teacher, my social studies teacher, and I'm, I'm visiting with all, I'm having Teachers Appreciation Month here. I'm visiting with all my teachers. And, you know, back in history class, I remember Mr. Schley and Ms. Simpkins, my teachers, Mr. Zentz, would tell me all that, checks and balances. And then I watched, uh, you know, a Congress that really put on a sham of an impeachment, you know, for my taste as a citizen, where, you know, facts were withheld, evidence was withheld, and then I hear you just openly, as a representative of, of, of me, of the people, talk about sabotage inside the United States Postal Service committed by the people running it. I, I, and and I, I, I remember when the banks went sideways, nobody went to jail. I, are people going to go to jail for this in the end of the day? I mean, when, when this is all place, over with. I didn't, I didn't say sabotage. I'm saying that all of a sudden the facts are there that you have somebody taking over the post office who's one of Trump's big supporters. But taking equipment uh, never... out is sabotage to me. If you're taking out modern equipment and we saw pictures of this everywhere, that's, that's sabotage. That's not enhancement. But in our country, you have, if you've done and broken the law, you have to be proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So all we're saying is the indication was there. I'm not saying it was sabotage yet. But you look at the fact. That's my words, so, not yours. That's fine. I'll own those. That's when Congress stepped in, including myself. 
I went to Dundalk Post Office. I saw what was going on. We put out a press release and, and, and it grew throughout the United States. We've got to get on top of this issue. You know, because remember, the people that work at the post office, they're Americans in a culture that care about the mail. Come, come hell or high water, they will get the mail out. And when their trucks are half full because they can't get the, the mail from the distribution center, we find out equipment's taken out, they're upset. And I hopefully, I think we're on top of it. I think we, we're going to not allow it to occur. But just look, look at the patterns of the things that have happened. That's what you have to look at, of a person at the top who seems to be setting up a situation to protect himself no matter what the voters say. And that bothers me. Dutch. But look, there are people. Look, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Dutch. I have to say this. I represent a lot of people who really respect Trump. They like what he's doing. So, you know, I'm their constituents, too. So I have to make sure that they, their point of view can be heard too, that their evidence can be out there. I don't, just, I don't agree with them, but I represent them. And it's my job to make sure that they have the funding for schools, police, fire, you know, infrastructure, all these things that we need from a federal point of view to get to the state and local governments, which by the way, is not happening now. We need to pass this next COVID bill just to help local. And well, that's, that's where I wanted to go, Dutch. I'm, I'm glad, glad, you, did that glad, well. you, I'm glad yeah. you segued. I'm glad you segued into that because I, I just, you know, recently the speakers come out and again, just bemoaning the fact that Mitch McConnell and the president are walking away from getting any kind of additional aid to not only our citizens, not only our small businesses, not only our schools, but state and local government. The House has had a bill on the table. You guys have been, you've come down a trillion dollars and we can't get, it doesn't appear that Mitch McConnell and the president are able to sit down with the speaker and get this done. Give our listeners an update. Now we know time is marching on and it, and it may be changed a million times by the time people hear this, but tell us where we are right now, going back to Nestor's question, which is critical. Can the government get something done to help the people in your district, the second congressional district? It depends a lot where you are now, the leadership at the top. And, and the leadership at the top refuses to consider the needs of the constituents, of the people that don't have a job for no fault of their own. You know, we need to move forward. Now, there are issues of fraud. Well, you know, you're going to have fraud wherever, but we're on top of this as much as we can, working with the feds and the state. Now, people are saying, why, uh, why do we have to keep doing this? Why do we have to give people money? Why won't they give money anymore? Let me tell you what's going on. You know, we have a, the most serious situation we've ever had in this country. It, even a lot worse than in, I think it was 1918, when we had the Great Depression. So what we have done, and it's a good system with the first package, we've given people money so they can take care of the basic needs of their family. Well, what that does, it allows them to have that small amount of money, but enough to, to exist to go to stores and buy things. Well, if you take away that money from those people, they're going to be worse. They're going to have to rely on, on state and local government that, that need help. And, and then when we wake up from this COVID issue, uh, we're going to be in a worse situation. So the key is to keep the economy moving. We had a tax cut that was trillions of dollars, about one and a half trillion dollars. And the most of the money went to the upper 1%. You know, it didn't go to middle class. Look at history. Look at Bill Clinton. The last time we were able to balance the budget when Bill Clinton was president. And what did he do? He gave a tax cut for the middle class. Middle class gets the money, they spend it on the basics and spend it on their everyday operations with their, with their families. And you know, right now, uh, we, we, it seems that a couple people, our president, McConnell, they won't deal with anything. I mean, Trump just yesterday said, we're not even gonna negotiate anymore until after the election. And then the next day, that's why I asked my staff, what's Trump's tweet of the day? You never know. Uh, the next day, we have a situation where he said, well, we're going to give it to the airlines. And then we might give it to the people. I mean, you know, there's no plan. There's no consistency. You know? and, and, then, and then this issue you know, of the Supreme Court, from my point of view, you know, it went one way, the other side. McConnell controlled that the first time when we had a nominee and McConnell would not take it to a vote until the election. And then they, then they confirm. Now it's the opposite way. And they're pushing this through instead of waiting for the election and, and to find out, you know, who's going to win. 
And so it's just so raw, such raw in your face politics. It's really upsetting. And that's why I think Trump, Trump's numbers are down. <clears throat> and what bothers me too, you know, I'm pretty bipartisan. When you start in local government, your, your management in local government, you've got to work about the basics, the infrastructure, the schools, and you can't play a lot of the politics that you have over here. But you know, what's happening, what's happening right now, it's, it's a couple people that are hurting our country. Uh, they're bringing us down. And by the way, let's talk about our, our relationships with other countries too. NATO is very important. We haven't had a world war. You know, we support each other. Uh, it, and, and Putin wants to do away with NATO. It's a thorn in his bonnet, whatever you want to call it. And, and you know, we, we, really, uh, we really have to reach out to the rest of, of uh, our allies and make sure that we work together as a team. That's not happening with Trump. This relationship that Trump has with Putin really concerns me, but I'm not going to get into that right now. Uh, so ask me some more questions. Well, I, Dutch, I, Dutch, I want to pick up on the bipartisan thing. Okay. Because recently the vice president gave a speech at Gettysburg that has received reviews that I think are rarely received anymore about a speech from an elected official or a candidate in which he called on the nation to come together. And he basically said, whether you're voting for me or not, I'm going to be your president and we're going to change the tone in Washington. Now, as well received as that speech was, a lot of the, my cynical friends will say, Don, it was a great speech, but it ain't happening. And you've been pushing this bipartisan thing, Dutch, for 30, 40 years. You've never been seen as a guy of the extreme left. You're not a guy of the extreme right. Dutch Ruppersberger is seen as a meat and potatoes guy right down the middle who can talk to everybody. How does Humpty Dumpty put this partisan division back together again, Dutch? Because it's chaotic. Got to get the facts on the table, the true facts. And it's about trust and relationships. Throughout my years in politics, in the end, if you want to get things done and, and you're in a political situation, it's trust and relationships. Mike Rogers, my counterpart on the Intelligence Committee, when we were in leadership, that committee was known to be very, very uh, political. And uh, the, the Washington Post called it a snake pit at one time. When Mike and I came together. We said, this is ridiculous. This is serious. We have had 9-11. We've had these issues. We have Russia, China, North Korea threats. We've got to come together. And it's trust the relationships. And those relationships grow on both sides of the aisle. But when you have leadership at the top, whose focus is more about himself than about the constituents, when he, when he makes these comments, these racial comments and these things, look at the facts. And, you know, America together is stronger than being separated. And there are certain things that we don't tolerate, certain, uh, certain uh, uh, comments that we should never tolerate, especially as a leader. When our leader knocks the, C the, the intelligence community and, and the CIA and the S NSA and FBI, and, and they're out there to protect us throughout through other parts of the world. I mean, that just doesn't get it. And, and what's happening now when we have a crisis, we have no plan. There's no plan out there. Uh, as far as, as Obamacare, thank God we have Obamacare and thank God we can deal with pre-existing conditions. You know, if we don't get uh, this thing resolved and if Trump wins again and he and the Supreme Court, uh, which he's put a lot of people on it, they not get Obamacare, we're gonna have a crisis and we're gonna have millions of people that aren't gonna have insurance. These are the things in the end, and this is where my experience and Don, you worked at it too in, in local government, uh, you, you can't be p as political in local government. You've got to produce on the basics and you've got to balance your budget. So I think those of us who serve in local government look at things a little bit different than the idealistic issues that, are, that exist here in Washington. But Dutch, Dutch let, let's build on that because I think it's probably the most important issue that I hear from people all the time. Folks that I talk to out here in middle America – they want government to work. That's what we heard from Nestor. They're, they're tired of the gridlock and everybody just sort of being in a caged steel match. So philosophically, 
you were saying that philosophically. The vice president is saying that. I think what's not clear to people, Dutch, and maybe maybe it's because it's hard to make clear, but how do guys like you and folks like Vice President Biden, assuming he wins, how do you actually begin to turn this battleship so that we stop this constant back and forth and gridlock? How, specifically, how does it happen, Dutch? Okay, first thing what you do, you have to have good leadership at the top who cares about their constituents and their country as it relates to the president. You've got to set a standard. The second thing is that people like me who are pretty bipartisan, you know, we're USA first, other than an election time when we support our parties. And you, you put bills together. You know, I've, I've got a, a bipartisan bill right now that, that uh, uh, just last week the House passed my bills. Again, it has to go to the Senate. And that's to help state and local governments um, improve their cybersecurity defenses. I represent NSA. I look after NSA's budget. But cybersecurity is one of the biggest threats we face in the world. And, and, and we're, we lose billions of dollars and it can be used uh, in, in a lot of different ways. So we're, we're, we're working and we're reaching out on both sides of the aisle. Well, Dutch, I guess I live in Baltimore City. There'd be no greater case than malware to, to see what happened to our city, yeah. right? Like that yeah. these threats to our credit cards and our phones and technology. I always say to my wife, the day the Russians take the grid down, that's, that's the worst day in America when, when the electronics stop. And we've seen these attacks. We know what China's capable of. We saw the Russian troll farms, and I see them again in the middle of the election. And we haven't done anything about these things. Well, we have. Let me say this. NSA, in my opinion, and what they do in the cybersecurity realm is still the best in the world. There's a lot of competition out there with China and Russia and, and Iran, and, but we are as good as anybody. And, and unfortunately, a lot of people think NSA is listening to them. They're not listening to anybody. By the way, that's the checks and balances that we provide to make sure that NSA and the other agencies are following the law. But what we have to do is to make sure we give the resources to our agencies. Now, why I just put in this bill that's just gonna help cybersecurity was because of the ransomware in Baltimore City. And I reached out and got someone who's respected on the Republican side, and we have a bill that's out to help to protect us as it relates to lesser the things you just talked about. Um, you know, and, and our bill, it authorizes uh, uh, new federal grant money to state and local, local governments to protect their networks from cyber attacks because most of the state and local, some are more sophisticated than others, they're not used to this. They don't, they don't have the technology or the people that know how to protect themselves. So it's up to the federal government to set the standard, get them, help them as far as getting resources to them to have the equipment to protect us. And that's what you do in Congress. It's about trust and relationships and getting enough votes to pass your bills. And, and that means when I, we were in the minority, you know, I represent five different jurisdictions, you know, Howard County, uh, Anne Arundel County, Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Harford County, and, and very diverse, a very diverse area. But, you know, my goal is to represent these constituents to make sure they're protected. So you do a macro as far as throughout the world and, and what you know, FBI does and CIA does and, and all of that. But you don't forget the basics, the infrastructure, you know, the schools, the things that we used to deal with in local government. You know that, Don. And, and so this all has to come together. But you need to work on both sides of the aisle. But we uh, have to, like, go ahead, Dutch. McConnell or, or some of the other people that are so far out. And by the way, we've got that on both sides of the aisle. The people are so radical. It's not about what's right for our constituents in America. It's their political agenda. And when you're focusing on just a political agenda, especially in these difficult times, it's not going to work. Well, Dutch, let's, talk, uh, let's, let's build on that, because when you talk about the, the, certainly the diversity on the Democratic side and the Democratic caucus, um, obviously the three of us, and, and we're going to be speaking with her shortly, have an incredible fondness for the speaker. I mean, across the nation, it's, it's Speaker Nancy Pelosi. To those of us here... It's uh, Nancy Dalessandro, Dalessandro Way, Little Italy, IND. I mean, we have this particular, we burst with pride over the speaker. You've, you've known the speaker forever. You've been friends forever. Give our listeners, Dutch, a sense of what makes her so effective. I mean, she never gets slapped around. 
by this president. She keeps this incredibly diverse Democratic caucus together. What makes this little lady from Little Italy so effective? Well, let's talk about Little first. And I think you have to look at her roots, the D'Alessandro family. They were all well-respected. Her father was a great mayor and well-respected. Uh, her brother was a mayor and, and, and well-respected. When Nancy was a little girl, those were the days when people would line up and Nancy and her mother would see constituents and then get the information to her father. So she grew up with politics and she had a lot of brothers. She was the only woman, so she was not used to, hold one second, she was not, <laughs> yeah, she was not, she was, uh, uh, she, she was not used to uh, being pushed around or she, because her brothers, five brothers that she had. And, and then she's smart and, and she ended up having a Catholic education. Unfortunately, her, uh, her school was just closed down. Um, her elementary and, and, and high school was closed down, but uh, she went to a Catholic school, came together and then married a very uh, successful person in California. Now, you know, Nancy is honest. She cares about people. She cares about families. And because of that, she knows what families need, not just all the idealistic issues of the multi-billion dollar companies and that type of thing. She understands how important jobs are, but she's got a moral backbone. She knows what's right. Now look, her politics are a lot different than mine. I mean, you know, she was very liberal representing California. You know, I took Bobby Ehrlich's seat and had a race with Helen Bentley, who became my good friend. In fact, I spoke at her funeral. So, you know, and that was about relationships too. So we come from different ilks, but she was always there. When I, when I was in leadership, the intelligence committee, uh, she, she said, here's the job, do the best you can, I'll try to support you. And, and then she left me alone. And to well, do Dutch, the hey, Dutch, Dutch, I'm going to interrupt, and I apologize for that, and our listeners are going, ah, there they go again. These guys always interrupt people. But I want to take that specific example. Nancy Pelosi was able to develop this relationship and work closely with centrist Dutch Ruppersberger, and Nancy Pelosi also has developed a very good relationship with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, speaking very glowingly about her recently when – uh, the congresswoman was attacked by the other side. Specifically, take us behind the scenes. How does Nancy Pelosi work with Dutch Ruppersberger and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez? Relationships and trust. She listens to other people's point of view, and then she tries to find a result. She also has to, it's like herding animals, cows, as an example. She has to bring her huge caucus, over 200 people, together and to try to find a way to get the votes because she's in charge of our caucus, our democratic caucus. And so there's got to be give and take. But if you're a leader that's just, this is my way, there's no other way, it's not successful in the end. And that's how, how we ended up getting the majority back because that was happening on the other side of the aisle. The radicals were, were in charge. You need balance in politics. Again, that comes back, Don, to our roles in local government the basics, taking care of the basics. And Nancy grew up like that. She's very honest, she's very smooth, uh, she's calm. I mean, in my opinion, you know, the way she is negotiating this, and she's doing most of it herself, is, is masterful uh, with Trump and, and, and you know, with the, with the people that she's dealing with on the other side of the, of the aisle. But she, she didn't get into politics, she was involved, but as elected official until after she raised five kids. And it has all these grandkids. You know, grandkids are the gift you get for not killing your own kids when you raise them. <laughs> <laughs> you, have, you have five of them, right, Dutch? Yeah, that's why I said it. <laughs> Dutch Rubensberger <laughs> from the 2nd Congressional District. And uh, I got a couple of Baltimore County executives, Don Moeller, here as well today. And uh, in, in wrapping up our time, I, I want to talk about, about COVID. And I know there's a film coming out next week about the federal response and Jared Kushner and the states and uh, testing and, and, and all of it. Uh, I want you to give me a little bit of a summation because, you know, we wait our whole lives for a plague, right? And we've always fended these off as a nation. There was a playbook for this. Um, I don't believe we followed the playbook, Dutch. I don't know if you believe that or not and, and where we are and where we could have been. And, the, you know, the milk spilled at this point. But getting this thing contained now will be 
job number one, two, and three for Joe Biden if he's elected. And God help us if, you know, if the other guy somehow steals another election because th- there is no plan. I mean, other than herd immunity at this point. When you, ha- when you have a problem, you have to address it and you have to put a plan together and you have to follow through with your plan. We did that in the first COVID relief. And we got, we got results. People, we kept the, the economy moving. The stock market's still doing well because we were able to keep moving with that relief. Now, for whatever reason, our Republicans, mostly McConnell, they refuse uh, to deal with the, the, the second package. And I blame the senators, the Republican senators, and some of them are my friends, for not standing up to this president and say, enough's enough. I said, you know, our constituents are hurting. We need help. So, you know, um, until we can get more resources, the state and local government, it's going to get worse, not better. Now, we need a plan. And Biden has a plan. He knows what he needs to do. I've worked with Biden. I trust Biden. I know that Biden cares about his constituents, and hopefully he will be president and be able to deal with this. Um, the, the lack of funding, though, is a major issue that we're, we're dealing with here. Um, the, the other issues that we have to deal with, we're also dealing with our own budget. You know, forget the issue. We got the COVID, which one priority, but we do budgets every year, which pay for everything. And right now, you know, we were going to December, I think, 11th. If, if we don't pass something, the government could be shut down again, which the Republicans did to us on, on numerous occasions. And what did, it, what did we get? It, we, get we got our constituents were hurting. Uh, it separated our country. Look, we want to be proud that our country is the best in the world. We need to reevaluate where we are. We've got to stop separating two sides. We've got to come together. There are a lot of things we're not going to agree on. That's what debating is about. But in the end, this has got to stop this negativity. I mean, some of the comments that were just put out here today by our president were just, you know, kind of outrageous. And the things that he said and, and about our country. And well, he's, he, he said the, the attorney general is not doing the job. He's got to start prosecuting my political opponents. What are you kidding? That's like a dictator. I mean, this is the kind of stuff we have to stand up. And I'm looking for my Republican friends in the Senate to start standing up before it's too late. Well, I, I, think you, I think you may be waiting a while for that, Dutch. I think they've made their bed. They have to sleep in it. Uh, I, I know we're, we're coming up on time. Uh, we, we cannot, and I'll just also say in response to what you just said about the president's recent actions, uh, his behavior since he was diagnosed with COVID is extremely alarming. We had the Mussolini moment on the balcony. We have him... Uh, going down uh, back to the Oval Office against doctor's orders. We now have close to 40 people on the White House staff infected. So we we are indeed in uncharted waters. But let, let's close with something, Nestor, a little more optimistic. We can't have Dutch Ruppersberger on here who played football proudly for one of the great football minds, George Young at City College. As, as we record this, Dutch, the Ravens are at the quarter pole. They're three and one. They had a tough outing against Kansas City. Give us the Dutch Ruppersberger scouting report on the Baltimore Ravens as we go forward. Well, I'd love to do that because I love football and the Ravens. Uh, the first thing, uh, we've got to have a better pass rush. Uh, we've added some quality players to the defensive line. But right now, we, the schemes that we're using, it just isn't working. Uh, you know, we, we had one injury in our defensive backfield. We've got a great defensive backfield. Uh, but if you don't have pressure on the quarterback, they, the quarterback will eventually eat you up. So that's very important. I think we've got to decide who's going to be the running back uh, and, and pick the, the majority of the plays. We Playing everyone is fine, uh, uh, but, you know, eventually uh, we're not – we don't have the ground game we had last year. I think we snuck up on people. So we have to have some different schemes, give some of the younger players a chance, see who's really going to – going to be able to be that, that person. And then I like the fullback. Our fullback's doing pretty well. He's getting a lot of yardage when you give him the ball and he can block. Um, you know, the schemes with, re, with respect to uh, our, our ends and, and, our, and our receivers, uh, we've got speed with time. Uh, we, we will get better there. I mean, they're going to target on Hollywood first, but we've got to ha- get other people in, in the passing schemes also. Um, you know, it's... Uh, as far as uh, our offensive line, they're more of a running than, than they are pass blocking. Uh, we're going to have to keep working at that. When you lose our, our all-pro uh, 
uh, right guard, that was a big loss. And so we're going to have to develop the scheme to protect that too. Uh, thank goodness, you know, our, our tight end had a great game last week, Andrews, and, you know, he's got to produce in order for us to move forward. Uh, All right, Dutch, two I quick. was going to call you Wink, uh, Wink Rupersberger, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and Mel, Mel Kuyper, Rupersberger. Two quick predictions, Dutch. How many electoral votes does Joe Biden get? Uh, you know, I can't answer that at this point. It's still too, too volatile out there. You know, I see a lot of Trump people, and a lot of Trump people stay so close to him, no matter what he does, they keep supporting him. Um, but a lot of the, the polls are starting to show a lot of people in that, that percentage are starting to leave him because his leadership is so outrageous. Are, the, the, I always ask, are you better off now than you were four years ago? And we are not in good shape. We don't have plans. We haven't dealt with all of the problems that we're dealing with. So uh, I think that's too soon to really say that at this point. Right, and then think? finally, finally, how many games do the Ravens win? Look, you know, I, I would hope they would continue to move on. Uh, we'll find out. Again, can't predict it. I'm very worried about Kansas City, another game of them. They're good. They got a tremendous coach. They got a great team. And their quarterback is really more sophisticated. I love our quarterback, and he's going to keep growing and, and learn that he got his passing, his long passes under control. But, you know, the it's fun to watch, and that's what's important. And we need sports right now just – is a relief from all the negativity that's out there and where people, what people are doing and they're staying at home a lot more. So, Nestor, we love the congressman. No more, and don't forget the Orioles either. You know, <laughs> there we go. And, and we're going to do fine. we got a good team, but you got to have patience when it comes to the Orioles. There we go. Nestor, we love the congressman from the 2nd District, Dutch Rupersberger. He was our first guest. He is our 300th guest. Dutch, Take tell the Orioles to sign a lease. Tell the Orioles to sign a lease on the way out the door. I got to go. Oh, you right. guys are doing a great job. Thanks for what you do. Thank, Thank you, you very much. It's one of the reasons we're best of Baltimore, because Dutch Ruppersberger came in episode one down at Pizza John's. Now we're in the COVID thing. We can't even take him down to Fadley's for a crab cake. Always good. Always the best crab cakes for Fadley. No question. There you go. You know, the best segments are the ones where I have two Baltimore County executives. You'd even agree with that, Don, right? <laughs> I do. We got to go find Hutchinson and Venetoulis before it's all over with. Yeah. On behalf of Dutch Ruppersberger in the house and, uh, of course, uh, our, our good friend Don Moeller, county executives, both of them, we are WNST.net, AM 1570 Towson, Baltimore. We never stop talking you Baltimore it. positive. Yeah.